and welcome to the Connecting Citizens to Science podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Ozano. This is a podcast about how communities and people join with researchers and scientists to identify solutions to global health challenges. Please don't forget to like, rate, share and subscribe so that we can continue to share voices from around the world from people who are really driving lasting change. We hope you enjoy. Well, haven't I got a fantastic episode for you today? It's the Swab and Send program from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. The idea of this is really to put citizens in the driving seat of identifying new bacteria to help in the fight against antimicrobial resistance or AMR. As we are using antibiotics more often in our lives, we need to develop a new generation of drugs that can help fight antibiotic resistance. The idea behind the program is that we, as the public, go out and collect samples of anything we think may be home to bacteria. We swab that area, we put it in a little tube containing black agar, and we send it off to the scientists at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, where they do their magic to identify how this can help to inform new antibiotics to overcome resistant bacteria. So let's go ahead and meet our guests. Today we have Amy McClemon, who is a postdoc research associate at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And we are really excited to have Lou Kellett, who is an enthusiastic and active citizen scientist who has been gathering samples for the Swab and Send program in Wales. And we also have Adam Roberts, who is the real driving force behind this program. So Adam, welcome to our podcast. Tell us the story of how this began and what it's all about. Hello, everybody. Swab and Send came into my mind in about 2015, and I wanted to carry out a project which both engaged the public in terms of their knowledge of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance, and also could do something useful for science. And the main premise behind the Swab and Send project is that the antibiotics that we currently use to treat infectious disease are becoming less effective. The the rates of resistance in bacteria are increasing across the globe. And unfortunately, there's not a large pipeline of new antibiotics coming to market. Now, one of the things that many people may not know is that the majority of the antibiotics that we use are naturally produced by bacteria and fungi anyway. So they're natural products. Um, Alexander Fleming was just very, very lucky when he noticed that one particular fungus on an agar plate was killing the bacteria that that he was working on. So there was this kind of zone of inhibition around the fungus. It was pumping out this antibiotic, which was later called penicillin. um, And it was killing the staphylococcus bacteria that Alexander Fleming was working on. And that was the first time anybody noticed that the natural products, these antibiotics that we now use in medicine regularly, are produced by bacteria and fungi naturally. And I thought, why don't we look for other bacteria and fungi that can produce antibiotics, we might find some novel ones. Now, most of the antibiotics that we get at the moment are produced by bacteria and fungi from soil originally. Soil is a really diverse community of bacteria and fungi. You only have to look very easily and you will find bacteria that produces antibiotics. But the unfortunate thing is that we found most of the antibiotics that soil bacteria produce. So we therefore need to look in other places. I thought that was a really key way to bring in citizens to decide exactly where we look for bacteria and fungi that could produce novel antibiotics. It wasn't at the start supposed to be something that would last years and years and years. I just wanted to try it out. Within the first two weeks, ITV News had got hold of it and it was on their website. And then it just went from strength to strength. And people started to participate across the country. And then schools and colleges started to participate as part of their science clubs and their biology clubs. It continued to evolve as a project, both online and in the laboratory. Um, And I was really lucky to have within my group enthusiastic people who would do a bit of this work in the lab in addition to their own projects. We started to find quite a lot of activity. By activity, I mean, we started to find quite a lot of microbes that produced antibiotics and killed bacteria and the fungi that we want to kill. These are important clinical pathogens. So that enabled us to put all of this data on the website and say, hey, look, this is working. And then that snowballed and more people started to take part. It appeared in the Atlantic magazine over in the States. So we got a lot of interest from the USA. Then I moved to LSTN in 2017 and the project came with me. And LSTN really got behind it in a big way. And it's now kind of a self-sustaining project 
where I really don't need to do anything to publicize it. People know about it. It's known within the community. And we get repeat participants from various schools and colleges um, and individuals such as Luke, who's on the line. It's going really well. And we've got lots of hits which have gone into the more traditional drug discovery science that we do. It's a successful project that started out small and has become a big thing, self-sustainable on its own. And it's really good fun. It's really amazing. It's astounded me. What a journey you've been on personally and to see it grow so much. It feels like a movement. It's really different to other citizen science approaches. It feels much bigger than just a science project. Let's hear more from someone who's directly involved in it. Lou Kellett, welcome to the podcast. Hi. You are one of these fantastic citizen scientists that are engaged in this project. Tell us why and how. I think I came across it in the first place on uh, Adam being interviewed on Radio 4. I was working on my friend's farm at the time, and I thought that sounds interesting because we we're more or less organic. We didn't use a lot of antibiotics on the animals unless we absolutely had to. So I sent off for a set of swabs and thought, I must have some things around here that other people won't have access to, so I'll go and poke at those. How do you decide what to poke at, I think was the term you used there. How often do you do it? Tell us a little bit more about that. I guess I was thinking of what I've got access to that other people might not. So uh, I was helping my boss to clear out the loft above the milking parlour and there was his great granddad's beekeeping hives in there. I thought that's unusual. They haven't been touched since about the 1930s. There might be something hanging around on there. I did a local stone circle just because I thought the conspiracy theories would be funny if it turned out that that came up with a new penicillin. Just depends on seeing something and thinking, oh, how about that? Amazing. It really does sound like you look for unusual areas to swab. We have Amy with us, who is a scientist. How does that fit in, Amy? Is that what you're looking for citizens to do? Yeah, exactly. So we're just looking for everyone to look at something they think is interesting and send us whatever it is. We've had some really interesting things in from old uh, religious artifacts that have been lost and found and like holy water and things like that it's just really cool to get things that are so different and that we personally don't have access to this is one of the important aspects of the project because we want to not replicate what has been found in soil previously one of the best ways to almost randomize your sample collection is to ask the public because they have such a collective opportunity to sample the rest of the planet something that we couldn't do as a research group here at lstm Mm. The project really relies on their imagination and simply being prepared. If they see something, it could just be a muddy puddle. It could be a 50-year-old beehive. Just being able to be prepared and think, actually, that could be quite interesting. Let's send off a sample from that particular thing. Okay, that's that's helping me understand more. Lou, I understand that you've not connected directly with the scientists at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. So now is your opportunity. Do you have any questions? I have loads of questions. <laughs> fire away okay what actually happens to the swabs that we send because i've had pictures back from adam before of an agar plate with blobs on but what's the process of getting it from the stick i send you to the plate full of blobs that's a great question lou what the team does in the lab when they receive the swabs is to streak them out onto an agar plate that's just a, to run the swab over the surface of it and then we incubate that for a few days either 37 degrees if it's a particular type of sample from an animal, for example, or at room temperature, if it's an environmental sample. And then we watch the colonies grow. The colonies really represent individual bacterial cells from the swabs, which are replicated. In one little colony of um, bacteria on an agar plate, you may have 10 million cells. And that's now enough for us to work on. We will then take that colony and we will put that in what we call a microtiter plate. This is essentially a plastic plate with 96 wells in it, all gridded out, very, very tidy. If you can imagine each one of those wells now has a little bit of liquid growth media for the bacteria and 96 individual bacterial colonies that we've got from the agar plates from any of the swabs, we can then use what we call a hedgehog, which is actually a 96 pin replicator to dip into all of those wells at the same time and then put that on another agar plate. Now, that agar plate has been pre-inoculated with the pathogens, so the disease-causing bacteria that we want to try and kill. 
it could be MRSA, for example, it could be E. coli. And what happens now is that all of those 96 different bacteria are growing at the same time as the pathogen on the background of the plate. If any of those 96 different bacteria from the swab are producing an antibiotic themselves, that will diffuse into the media and it will stop the E. coli or the pathogen growing. Okay, so if one of the bacteria from one of your swabs produces this zone of inhibition, it means it's producing something which is killing our target bacteria and we're interested in it. We'll then take that and we'll put that in what we call our hit plate. This is another plastic plate with 96 wells. In that plate, there's only the ones that are active against our indicator strain. That's what we then pass over to Amy to do the more traditional scientific investigations to allow us to try and determine what species of bacteria it is and also what it is producing. When I get the samples, we've got an idea that they're active and that there's something in there that we want to research. Then I try and separate out all the different things that the bacteria produce. I've got a piece of equipment, it looks very fancy, it looks very technical, but all it does is it separates out all of those molecules into different sizes or different polarities. And we can look at them more separated, see if the activity is still there. And we can start to look at what they are, what size the molecule is, what shape it is. So that's further along the line. And that process okay. can take up to 10 years. If you're wow. a pharmaceutical company, for example, with 200 people in the department looking at drug discovery, they may be able to screen thousands of bacteria producing thousands of molecules over a decade, and they may end up with one molecule, which is useful for medicine. We're a little bit smaller scale than that. So things take time after that initial microbiology work. So some of the things that we're looking at, which are really exciting, we project would be in a position to be tested probably in five to six years. Wow. Okay. So if you've got something and it looks like it's going to work, how do you go about getting more of it like do you synthesize what the person swabbed if it's something you can't go back and swab again great question so you know the original 96 well plate that i talked about where we've got uh -huh. all of the bacteria so we also store those in the freezer we can always go back to the original bacteria so we don't need to revisit the site currently we have almost sixty thousand different types of environmental bacteria and that's one of the largest libraries of environmental bacteria in certainly in the UK, perhaps in Europe as well. That's a really valuable resource with which we can screen endlessly for different things. How much freezer space does that take up? <laughs> Quite a lot. So <laughs> our freezers are about the size of a car. OK. Uh, you imagine a car on its end. That's mm -hmm. the size of a normal minus 80 degree freezer. But just going back to your point, Lou, once we know the identity of the molecule, the interesting molecule that's having the antimicrobial activity against pathogens, we can then work with our chemistry collaborators and they will probably be able to synthesize it. We can get grand scale amounts if the synthesis pathway is relatively easy and not too expensive. Then we can do all kinds of toxicology studies on it looking for emergence of resistance in different pathogens. At that point, we no longer actually need the original producing bacteria. So we've really separated ourselves from the swab and then okay. the bacteria itself. So we've just got this little pot of white powder, which would be the chemical that the original bacteria is producing from the original swab. I have a question just leading on from that. Adam, in terms of communication back to citizens who have taken their time to collect the samples, how have you been doing that? I wanted to use a platform that was free because we had no resources for it and also very accessible. So I decided to use Facebook. It's a really effective way to archive all of the data that we've produced. If you go onto the Facebook swab and send page, you can see all the way back to the inception of the project in 2015, you can see every single result we've ever generated and all of the discussions around those results. We get variable amounts of hits on the various posts. So if we get samples from a particular school, we will see that everybody who's got a Facebook page in that school has a look at it. That's really great because you know it's having a good penetration into that particular audience. In addition to 
the results that we generate from the swabs, we also put things on Facebook which are just important in terms of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. I think it was the new year of 2018, or it might have been 2016, I just put a quote from Alexander Fleming on the warning he gave in his Nobel acceptance speech about the possibility of resistance emerging. That went viral and that reached over a million individuals. And that really cemented Swab and Send as a project addressing AMR, antimicrobial resistance. I would say Facebook is our best platform for reporting the results, but Twitter is a lot better for publicizing the project and getting people interested in it. There's a kind of a different audience on those two platforms. This is a really great example. And at the Connecting Citizens to Science podcast, we talk a lot about communication and feedback back to citizens once they've been involved in research. So it's really great that you have found that and quite innovative as well in terms of generating activities. I think that's really useful for our listeners to understand. Amy, I guess you're quite removed from the citizen aspect in the laboratory. Do you have any questions for Lou? I do get to do some outreach, which is it's quite fun, but difficult for me to know why some people are a little bit hesitant to take swabs from us. And some people are really enthusiastic. It'd be nice to know what made you want to join in and maybe what made you a little bit hesitant if you were hesitant or if your friends are hesitant, how we could get them to join in as well. I just like taking part in in science projects really. I'm not at all a scientist. I work in food and farming but I just like the idea of being part of it and the premise that the more people you got involved then the more access you would have to a wide variety of things to swap. Wonderful. So Adam, I think what we would like to understand is what are some of the barriers that you've come across through the many years you've been working on this and what did you learn and how have you adapted? So longevity of a project such as this is important. It's really unlikely to be a success, both in terms of public engagement and in terms of finding any new antibiotics if it's only going to be a six-month project. You have to plan for that longevity. What was fundamentally important was the institutional support because then we could make it mainstream. That institutional support is both in terms of publicity and support for the landing page at LSTM. There was a pledging site put up, so it was a seamless donation of funds if you wanted to do that. Although that's never a barrier to participation, I would advise people to think about it at an early stage. Otherwise, you can get into all kinds of bureaucratic difficulties trying to put money into a university and fund your project that way. Um, the other thing that I would say is it's really important to have an enthusiastic team. I came up with a project. I acknowledge that, but I haven't done all the work. The work has been done by my team over the years and fantastic current team that we have, and they've really embraced it. It's really shown dividends as well, because recently we wrote it into a large grant application and that was subsequently funded. That transition from what you could call a hobby to a core component of your daily work is really important because it's not only drug discovery, but it embeds the public engagement aspects within your everyday life which is important for us. Great. Thank you very much. Amy, you were a postdoc, so you did your PhD and your postdoc on this project. How does this fit in terms of your career within, well, health systems more widely, really? I've come from quite a diverse study background, actually. I've done conservation. I've done plant pathology. My PhD was on pesticides, drug discovery. I've done some AMR, antimicrobial resistance work before, for me, it's a really important subject and it's got a lot of lifespan in terms of career plans. It's an interesting project. Like I think, Leo, if I was not a scientist, I would be like you joining in these public science things because I just find it interesting. It's really nice to be in the project and actually working on it and seeing these SOBs come in and all the examples, drug discovery and looking for new solutions to antimicrobial resistance is, is where I want to be. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Adam, you said in six years time, we might see results here. What is the overall aspiration here in terms of the gold standard of what could be achieved? There are two, two aspirations from the project. One is to increase awareness and subsequent stewardship of the antibiotics that we currently have. People are only going to look after them if they realize 
how important they are to our society, not just in the healthcare environment, but also in our food security and distribution networks. Also, there is a possibility that we may find something which is potentially a new antibiotic. Now, that is a needle in a haystack in a field full of haystacks. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no way to change that. But if we don't look, we will never find. And success doesn't depend entirely on finding the next new penicillin. What we could find is a novel molecule which affects a new drug target in a bacterial cell. Because not only do we need new antibiotics, we also need to increase our knowledge of different targets that we could screen existing compound libraries for. If we found something that affected a new target in or on a bacteria, we could then screen all of the different compound libraries that we have at LSTM and elsewhere in the country for antagonists to that particular target. And that may open up a whole new field and a whole new class of antibiotics. So each of those incremental steps increasing our knowledge is important. It's very unlikely there'll just be a huge leap and we'll find a medicine-ready molecule. Quite often what we'll find is something which works but doesn't work very well but then our medicinal chemists can alter the molecule and we can iteratively test it this is what takes years and years so we come up with a derivative of that original molecule which works better only targets bacteria and is able to get to the right place in the human or animal body fast success is the increase in knowledge in any one of those fields really that really helps me to understand the scope of work that has gone into this to reach those end goals. Lou, you are a citizen scientist. What piece of advice would you give to others who want to be involved in projects like this? Just go for it. It might be slightly intimidating in the first place if you're swabbing something in public and people give you funny looks or want to know what you're up. But I've got a lot out of it. It's just fascinating seeing the results come back. It sounds like you really enjoy it and are an asset, so we're glad to have you here. Amy, advice for others in your position? One of the challenges, and I've spoken to other people in community science projects, is getting ideas of how to reach as many people as you can. Adam's very good at the social media. I do a lot more of the in-person things, so at conferences, I've asked everyone to take a swab of their shoes while they're there. I've got quite a big family so I've got all of them involved and they're over the country it's just getting as many people involved as you can and being quite open to talk about it and take questions about it talking to other people in citizen science projects to get ideas of how they're doing outreach is one of the best ways to get started a real sense of community there I love that Adam final piece of advice and and anything you want our listeners to take home from this conversation I would say two things I'd say if you are thinking of starting your own citizen science, don't be fearful of the consequences of failure. Even if it lasts for a month or two, it's probably going to be useful for somebody. Just run them enthusiastically and put the work in and make it work for as long as they're tenable. Secondly, what I would say is to potential participants, echo what Lou says, have a go. You know, you never know. It's such a random project that you might be the lucky one that finds something key message there have a go and I think I'm taking that home at a personal level already I'm getting out there and swabbing and sending the minute I finish this recording so thank you so much to all of our guests I've really enjoyed the conversation thank you for our listeners do like rate share and subscribe so that we can get messages like this out to everyone so that people and communities can work with citizens and scientists to find solutions bye for now